Lars has agreed to show us, uh, talk to us about some of the stuff he's been doing with Delphi here. So I'll go ahead and make him a presenter. Actually met Lars when I was in Denmark. So uh, thank you for um, letting me attend. Um, Jim, we talked a bit about a bit interview style because you know the audience a bit better than me. I can uh, present myself first. Yeah, tell us a little about yourself and, and uh, brief, briefly about what you're doing and then I will go there and do some questions and such. Okay. Um, I'm the CTO of a Danish company. We are doing software for intensive care units uh, in hospitals. And we have a homepage and we also have a small video which is comprehensible by people who know English, so that should be most of you. You can go in and have a look at it yourself. Um, we make a solution in uh, Delphi and the interesting thing about this solution is it is um, a CE Mark product. I don't know how many of the audience know the CE Mark, but it is um, an important thing in uh, Europe. Um, it is used for uh, vehicles, it is used for uh, toys for children, it is also used for hospital equipment. Um, for medical devices, it is a bit similar to FDA approvals in the United States, and it follows the same standards. Um, so, when you go in and say it's a medical device, what is a medical device? Um, I can, sh if you uh, see my screen now, you should see a doctor operating a computer. Yep. And this is actually a PC. It l doesn't look like that, but inside there is a PC. It has some extra hardware. It has a touch screen and so on, but basically it's a PC. And this is a medical device. It ha has a huge effect on the patient's health because that's where you see whether the patient is alive or not, uh, heartbeat, <laughs> uh, blood pressure, whatever, um, and there's software inside. And it is quite a challenge to make sure that this works, because the philosophy with medical devices is, if something goes wrong, it should not be the device's fault, it should be uh, the operator's fault. And the operator, that would be the nurse or the doctor. So that also means that usability is a huge issue um, and if there is a usability problem, the producer of the software is most likely to blame. And I can give you an example of that. Um, I received a letter this summer. It was a letter from the Danish healthcare ministry and a nurse had um, done something wrong and this might have led to, or this could have led to bad decisions for the patients. And our system was part of that. Now, um, we analyzed the situation and we came up with uh, that the nurse had um, made an incorrect use of another device, which was not from us. And this incorrect use was uh, the cause of the problem. So I sent back a report to the healthcare ministry explaining why this nurse had wrong results because of a usability problem with a device that was not ours. So this is how you handle bugs when you're a medical device manufacturer. So even though it's all made in Delphi, you must um, handle this correctly. So that's really a challenge when you do software. How do you think using Delphi um, influences your ability to respond to situations like that when someone makes an assertion about the uh, way your software is behaving? Well, what we, what we do is we, uh, we follow a development um, methodology based on some standards. I have opened some tabs here. You can see the main standard, uh, 13485. There are some other standards, one here on... Uh, on uh, software in uh, medical devices um, and when you need to follow them with Delphi it is uh, not much different than other standards uh, and uh, than other development tools 
Um, but one thing you really appreciate is that you have a compiler that works, no compilation errors, that you have um, a code that is easy to manage, that you have code that is, um, for instance, every time an exception happens, we log it, include a stack trace, and send it directly to us. And having a programming language where this is possible, that's really great, and Delphi does this really well. Um, so there are some other tools out there that I would definitely not use for, for medical devices. Or if you do, you have a bigger problem with traceability. Um, in general, I think Delphi is a great tool for this, um, but I don't think it makes a big difference with regard to compliance, whether you use one tool or another. One of the important things though is when you need to look at an error, you must consider the whole system. The whole system it includes the computer. So you have a user who uses a computer. On this computer, a program is running. And then something incorrect happens. So who is to blame? Is it the user? Is it the keyboard, the CPU, the compiler, the programmer? Who, I mean, who is to blame? And here Delphi works on the standard Windows API that has not changed significantly for a long time. And that actually makes it much simpler than if you had some kind of runtime installed on the computer where you would not know which runtime it is. So um, in that way, Delphi also makes things simpler. Yeah, that's a good point. I, especially like with uh, FireDAC, how it has so much more of the drivers compiled in compared to like the BDE and you don't have as many dependencies. That's a, that's a, big, uh, a big deal, it seems like. Yes, dependency is really important. One of the things that um, um, we also see is that you don't want to have dependence on DLLs uh, installed um, by other uh, packages. Um, that is not a big problem these days, but uh, still sometimes it is depending on how the hospital is installing the software. Some of them are fortunately using installation packages, but there are also hospitals in some countries that are using what they call sneaker net, meaning they walk <laughs> around and start set up Excel on each computer and sometimes do manual stuff and it's not all well under control. So. There is actually a standard for how a hospital should run a network with medical devices. Um, so, um, and this requires the suppliers to tell about how does this software work. So, you need to describe this is a Windows uh, API based uh, software. It installs these and these files on the computers, it communicates like this. Um, patient data is transmitted like this and this, uh, encryption like that. So you need to describe all these things and you also need to describe what actions might cause problems for the patient. So if you shut down uh, the network, will that have an impact on the patient's health? Yes or no? Um, and you describe all this because the hospital needs to know. Um, and again, Delphi is... Uh, I think in the best end of all the development tools out there to to do this because it compiles things together. It's extremely well defined what it is the customer gets. Yeah, there's a question here comes in from Phil asking if you have any uh, strategies or tips for error trapping and logging because you mentioned that's really important. Um, yes, there is. Um, uh, when when you do use these standards, then you use also use a V model. The V model is um, you have uh, the top level uh, where you say you have the concepts, you have the requirements, you have detailed design, and so on. I usually uh, prefer to turn this a bit around um, because like this. Um, where you say you have the user needs, design inputs, detailed specifications, and so on. So the first thing is you need to uh, define what is a bug. Um, 
if you have a bug at design time, we call it design time when you design software. Uh, it's obvious when you design a form, but the same applies when you design soft source code. So you design a system for the user. Um, and we define all these requirements that must be fulfilled. These requirements do not only apply to the source code, they also apply to the PC or the network on which the software must run. So if you have a network connection to a server, this is a requirement. If it's not conformed to, so what do you do? Um, when you find a bug, there are two kinds. One of them is called um, a non-conformity. For instance, you say uh, the, the response time for a screen must be max one second, for instance, and it does not conform to that. So then you have a problem, you must solve that, and there is a specific procedure for how you must solve that. We don't have bug trackers. We don't, um, we don't use Mantis or Jira or, Jira or something like that for bug tracking. We have um, a cover list, corrective actions, preventive actions. So we get a problem in, the user says something does not work. We find out what is the root cause for that. We must uh, find a plan, a corrective action. You must consider whether preventive action is needed to make sure that this does not happen again. And we must uh, ref reference the implementation of it, including if the problem is at a hospital, the plan may include install the software at the hospital and somebody must check that it was installed. Before that has happened, you cannot close what we call the Kappa ticket, corrective action. Um, another kind of uh, error you could have is what we call a software anomaly. That is um, what most people call an exception. So all exceptions, they are called software anomalies. But you could also have that, for instance, you click a button, you expect it to open a certain form, and it opens another form. So it does not do as expected. That would be a software anomaly. You may not have a requirement on that, but you must treat software anomalies too um, with a similar corrective action plan and implementation. So you really get on uh, in control with your bugs, that's for sure. Excellent. Uh, do you use uh, special tools for like trapping stack traces and such for uh, and logging that errors and stuff like that at runtime? No, we um, actually I cannot remember how we uh, log it. Um, I think we extract it from the exception system. Um, we capture the exception, we extract the stack trace, save it, um, and as soon as the system has database access, we save it to the database. So, um, so we get everything captured into the database, and from there it gets transferred to to our system. You know, I, I've, I've shared a funny story, or at least I think it's funny, as you are showing the picture of the uh, the doctor working on the PC there, on, I think it was the third tab over. When yeah. uh, my wife and I were expecting our first child, we went to a couple different hospitals to, to check out what the birthing experience would be like there and stuff like that. And as the geek, I was actually working at a time for a, a software developer, or a, not for software, a com company that made computers, Micron Computer System, which is now defunct. But anyway... Um, I was looking at the computers they had in the hospital in the different rooms that they were using, and I noticed that the one hospital they were using compact computers, which I didn't have a high opinion of at the time because you know working for a competitor. So I was like, oh, I don't know about that. If I want to work, go to a place that uses compact computers. But is there are there standards now as far as which computer, how computers are, uh, or let's see, for computer systems to be used in medical industry or is are they considered interchangeable? Does it make a difference if it's a uh, where the computer comes from that's used as a medical device? Well, what you see here on the screen is a custom or a product that is made by um, a medical device vendor. So they will buy PC hardware and they will sell the entire box uh, under their own name. Um, but if I go back to to the first uh, one here and go back to the video, I don't know if uh, some of you have seen it. Uh, then I can show you, I'm um, oh, sorry about this one. Um, here uh, we have a um, screen 
or a situation where you have uh, first a patient monitor that is a special um, specialized computer hardware for this purpose. The second one, I'm not really sure, but the third one is actually a standard PC, but it is washable. So this is because this is the surgery room. So they buy special washable computers and they're like three, four, five thousand dollars. Um, and then, but as soon as you step outside the room, they have lots of uh, normal computers. So, um, and our software is mostly running on normal computers. So is that but what you are touch? But what touching you is actually an interesting point when you're doing software development because, from our point of view, our software must run on all the hospital's computers. So, if we, for instance, say a um, problem with a patient uh, makes a lamp red, so we have a red lamp on the screen. That means that the screen must be able to show a red lamp. So how do we as a manufacturer or software supplier ensure that the computer is able to show a red lamp? And what we found out was that 10% of the doctors could not distinguish our yellow and red lamps. So we put an ampersand in the middle of the red lamps because otherwise uh, we couldn't make sure that the doctor was able to see the red lamp. We had uh, to change the look of the lamp itself. To distinguish it. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that's where requirement management becomes really important. I mean, you cannot just have a bunch of programmers sitting down, say, now it works, see, and the boss says, yeah, it works. And then you send it to the doctors because that will fail. <laughs> uh, you need to involve the customer in this and you need to discuss it with them, you need to validate, you need to, yeah, you actually cannot make the software without having a doctor say, yeah, we can use this. Now, is this uh, picture we're looking at here, is that actually running your software on the computer there? Uh, I think so, but um, if I go a little further, this is our software. Now, what you see here on the screen is uh, just, you know, a normal form. Um, so that's not so interesting. Um, here you have a nutrition overview. You can actually, you know, say a piece of bread with cheese and put it in. Um, in the background, uh, that was also here. Here you have the same uh, software too. Um, this is the observation screen where we pull in data from ventilators, from uh, dialysis machines, patient monitors, and put it all together. We uh, save it on a special server and we can fetch like 2 million records from the server, aggregate them and show them on a chart in less than one second. Wow. So, and it's all, that's all the, your Delphi app that's pulling on the data in and, and displaying it in the server, putting it in the server, stuff like that, right? No, we also uh, do a drug management. So you can prescribe in the system um, and you can have the nurses register how much of the drug they have actually given to the patient. Um, and this way, the doctor knows whether this drug that was planned was actually given or not. Uh, when we came to the hospitals, uh, and that's that's a very uh, now I know there's a webinar later today about uh, data modeling, and that's where it becomes really interesting. When you talk to the doctors, they explain how things work, and then you take this explanation to the nurses and then the nurses say, no, that's not how it works. And then the nurses explain how it works. And then you take that back to the doctors and then say, no, 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 that's also not correct. So you have two different groups of uh, people working together and together they create wonderful things. Um, they are able to, to, I mean, I have seen things in hospitals um, curing patients that I would, never have thought possible. But when you talk about the knowledge about the, the entire process, then it is uh, not there. You need to interview many different people about the same process before you get the full picture. And we supply a system that is used by the different groups, uh, help them do what they need to do, and make them communicate via our system. So if a nurse, for instance, here we have a prescription um, where the nurse is registering how much he has given to the patient. If the nurse is a bit late, then she needs to explain why she was late. 
Um, and then the doctor now gets this information. Previously, that was uh, not communicated. So, um, so the doctors get more information today than they got previously. So that's a really big improvement. Here's a question about what database you're using behind the scenes for this. Um, for uh, most of the data, we use Firebird. And the reason why we use Firebird is because it was built from the start to support uh, long-time queries into a production database. And when you are working the intensive care unit, you really want to analyze your data. You want to know how many patients do we have that survived, uh, which patients survived, why did they survive? But we found out that for observation data, that was simply too uh, slow. So we are using a NoSQL technique that we have created ourselves, um, which is able to, as I said before, fetch millions of records and aggregate them in less than a second. Wow. Um, yeah, and then uh, besides that, we also have a lot of uh, data that we cache locally on, on the um, uh, client side because, again, uh, it would not be fast enough if we would always query the server. Um, on the screen right now, you can actually see observations from a specific patient. Um, what you can see is you have some ranges uh, with blue. Um, that's the lower and upper blood pressure, also called systolic and diastolic blood pressure. You have the mean arteric pressure and you have the heart rate. Now, the next thing that the user is clicking is the high resolution. And you could see how fast it went from clicking to showing the high resolution data. So what it did there was it was sending message to the server. I have these data. Do we have something newer? If yes, please send them to me. Then the server sends the new data back. It has in this uh, probably about, I would say, um, 100,000 records per chart. So that would be half a million uh, records. So it the client gets a half a million records. Then it aggregates it to maybe a chart of 800 pixels. So it subdivides the data into 800 slots. For each slot, it finds the maximum, minimum, first, and last value. And then it can show the chart so that all minimums and all maximums in um, all measurements, they're shown in this chart. There's no single measurement value that is outside what this chart shows. I can guarantee that. Because all this 500,000 records were analyzed in this click that you just saw. Well, I think we need to wrap up here pretty quick. Thank you for your time, Lars, though. I do have a couple last questions for you. Um, you mentioned how you're gathering data from different medical devices. Do you see, um, as we see more and more uh, connected medical devices going forward, do you see that being a, a really important thing in the future to, to be able to connect to all these different medical devices? Yeah, well, what we're doing is uh, to fetch data from medical devices. But you can also see something like this one. If you want to make a first aid uh, software for a mobile uh, phone, which, I mean, every teenager can do that today. You just start up Delphi and file a new mobile application, and then you write some tips on how to give first aid. Yep. Then you are suddenly uh, under the laws of United States and EU, a producer of medical devices. And this means you must prove that you have made this according to the standards. You must also be able to withdraw the product from the market immediately. I heard about one company that made such a first aid um, app. And one of the problems with the iTunes <laughs> store was that if they wanted to, to withdraw the product, it would take too long time. I cannot remember whether it took weeks or months or whatever. So, or if they wanted to update it. So they had to find a way to disable it immediately. And what they did was that every time you started off this app, it was checking an online server if it was still legal to run the software. And if not, it would disable itself. That's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is uh, becoming really big now. Um, 
all the authorities are becoming really focused on apps, on uh, Windows software and many different things. They must comply with these standards. And everybody who makes something about medication, first aid, anything that, I mean, even, uh, you know, uh, pregnancy prevention uh, things um, are covered by this on a very high degree. Um, so you really need to be careful when you go into healthcare uh, with software today. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Lars. This has been interesting. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for too. And um, at Compass Pascal, that's your blog, right? Yeah, that's a blog I have not written uh, for quite a while, but uh, yeah. I remember I, you have had, had good posts I've enjoyed in the past, so hopefully you got a 2015 post. It looks like. <laughs> just not as frequently as you used to. There's only one, yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, for uh, being part of Delphi Week. And Compass Pascal is a is a good history uh, Pascal lesson as well, if I if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was uh, the predecessor of uh, Poly Pascal, which was the predecessor of a product called Turbo Pascal. Exactly. All right, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you.